Rain lashed against the windshield, blurring the neon glow of the city into streaks of color that pulsed and bled into the darkness. It was the kind of night that made even the most jaded city dweller yearn for the comfort of home, the warmth of a familiar bed, the illusion of safety that the concrete and steel jungle offered. But I, Joran, or Jory as everyone called me, was out here, cruising the rain-slicked streets, a lone wolf navigating the urban wilderness, another cog in the machinery of the gig economy, another nameless face behind the wheel of a rideshare car. Four years I'd been doing this, four years of graveyard shifts, ferrying strangers through the city's arteries, a silent observer of human nature's best and worst, a collector of stories whispered in the back seat, confessions made under the cover of darkness, anxieties laid bare in the flickering glow of the dashboard lights. It wasn't a bad gig, not really. It paid the bills, kept me off the streets, gave me a sense of purpose, even if that purpose was just to get people from point A to point B, to be a temporary confidant, a silent witness to their lives. But it had changed me, hardened me, made me cynical. The endless stream of faces, the fleeting conversations, the glimpses into the lives of strangers had worn away at my empathy, leaving behind a shell of a man, a ghost behind the wheel, a phantom traversing the city's nightmarish labyrinth. I glanced at the rideshare app on my phone, its screen glowing, its map a spiderweb of neon lines that mirrored the city's tangled streets, a pulse of green indicating a potential passenger. The address, a cryptic combination of letters and numbers, was unfamiliar, its location on the outskirts of the city, near the edge of the map's reach, a place I'd never ventured to before. The fare estimate was good though, almost double the usual rate, and a flicker of greed, a need to chase those extra dollars, battled against the unease that settled in my gut, a warning that echoed in the whispers I'd been hearing lately, whispers that seemed to drift from the shadows, their voices a haunting chorus of caution and dread. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the accept button on the app's screen. The address, Whispering Pine Cemetery, sent a shiver down my spine, a sudden chill that had nothing to do with the rain-soaked night. Cemeteries. They were places of silence, of shadows, of stories untold, of a darkness that lingered even in the brightest daylight. I'd always avoided them, even during my years on the Force, when death had been a constant companion, a shadow that lurked at the edges of every crime scene. But tonight, something stronger than logic, stronger than fear, drew me towards the cemetery. It was the promise of a good fare, yes, but also something else, a curiosity, a need to confront the unknown, a morbid fascination with the darkness that whispered from the edges of my world. I tapped the accept button, the app's screen flashing green, the GPS guiding me towards the outskirts of the city, towards the heart of the night, towards the Whispering Pine Cemetery. The GPS led me through a maze of darkened streets, the buildings growing more and more dilapidated, the neighborhoods more deserted, the silence deeper as I approached the outskirts of the city. Rain lashed against the windshield, blurring the streetlights into halos of shimmering color, the wipers struggling to keep pace with the deluge, the world beyond the car a watery, distorted reflection. Whispering Pine Cemetery. The name itself sent a shiver down my spine. The cemetery, shrouded in fog, its ancient tombstones looming like silent sentinels, materialized out of the darkness, its presence a black stain against the city's glittering grid. The air grew colder, the metallic tang I had noticed earlier intensifying a cloying sweetness that mingled with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, an aroma that stirred a primal unease, a warning whispered on the wind. I pulled up to the iron gates, their metal rusted and twisted, a testament to time's relentless march, my headlights illuminating a solitary figure standing near the entrance. It was a man, tall and slender, dressed in a dark suit that seemed to absorb the shadows, his face pale and gaunt his eyes burning with a chilling intensity in the dim light. He approached the car, his movements smooth and deliberate, his presence radiating a coldness that made me pull my jacket tighter. 
though the air inside the car was already stifling. Joran, he asked, his voice a soft, cultured tone that seemed out of place amidst the cemetery's unsettling stillness. That's me, I replied, my gaze fixed on the man in the rearview mirror, his pale skin, his piercing blue eyes, sparking a primal unease that I couldn't shake. Silas, he said, sliding into the back seat, his voice a whisper against the rain's insistent drumming. Thank you for coming. He closed the door, the metallic clang of finality that sealed us within the car's confines. The scent of lavender, a discordant note against the metallic tang, now filling the small space. I pulled away from the cemetery gates, the GPS guiding me back towards the city, its digital map a grid of neon lines that seemed to mock the labyrinthine darkness that surrounded us. I glanced at Silas in the rearview mirror, his gaze fixed on the rain-streaked window, his pale face illuminated by the passing streetlights, his expression unreadable. So, Silas, I ventured, trying to break the silence, though a sense of unease, a premonition of something strange and unsettling, held me back from my usual banter. Late night visit to the cemetery? He turned his gaze towards me, his eyes meeting mine in the mirror, their intensity making me look away, a shiver running down my spine. I was paying my respects, he said, his voice a soft murmur, his words slow and deliberate, as though each one carried a weight that burdened his soul. To those who crossed over, his words, cryptic and unsettling, hung in the air, a reminder of the cemetery's silent residence, the whispers that seemed to follow us, their voices a chorus of the unseen, the unknown. I drove in silence for a while, the rain a steady drumbeat against the car's roof, the GPS guiding me through a maze of darkened streets, the buildings growing taller, the lights brighter as we approached the heart of the city. And then Silas spoke again, his voice a low, urgent murmur that drew my attention back to the rearview mirror, his blue eyes now fixed on mine, their intensity a palpable force that made me grip the steering wheel tighter. There are things in this world, Joran, he said, his words slow and measured, as though choosing them carefully, that defy explanation, things that lurk in the shadows, that whisper in the darkness, things that most people choose to ignore. His words, a chilling echo of the whispers that had been haunting me, sent a wave of unease through me, a primal fear that I tried to dismiss, to rationalize, to attribute to the lateness of the hour, the unsettling atmosphere of the city, the lingering effects of the cemetery's darkness. But deep down, a part of me, the part that had witnessed too much darkness in my years on the force, the part that had seen the patterns, the connections, the things that most people chose to ignore, that part of me listened. The rain continued its relentless drumming against the car's roof, a steady rhythm that matched the unease now pulsing through me. Silas's words, a chilling echo of the whispers that haunted my own thoughts, hung heavy in the air, the scent of lavender a strange counterpoint to the metallic tang that seemed to cling to him, to the car itself. Things in this world that defy explanation, things that lurk in the shadows. I glanced at him in the rearview mirror, his gaze now fixed on the passing cityscape, his pale face a mask of contemplation, his blue eyes reflecting the neon lights that blurred through the rain-streaked windows. You're talking about ghosts? I asked, my voice a hesitant rumble, the word feeling strange, out of place in the confines of my cab, a space I usually reserved for mundane conversations, for the everyday anxieties and frustrations of my passengers. Silas turned his gaze back to me, a faint smile playing on his lips, a smile that didn't reach his eyes, a smile that sent a shiver down my spine. Ghosts are just one manifestation, he said his voice a soft, measured tone. There are other realms, Joran, other dimensions, places that intersect with our own in ways we don't fully understand. He paused, his gaze drifting towards the GPS unit mounted on my dashboard, its screen glowing with a map of the city, 
a grid of neon lines that seem to mock the labyrinthine darkness that Silas hinted at. We think we're in control, he continued, his voice a low murmur, with our technology, our maps, our algorithms. But there are forces at play, Joran, that are older, more primal than anything we can comprehend. He leaned forward, his voice barely audible above the rain's drumming and the hum of the engine. There are gateways, thresholds, places where the veil between worlds thins, and sometimes things cross over. His words, a chilling blend of logic and the supernatural, sent a wave of fear washing over me, a cold dread that I couldn't shake. The air in the car felt thick, charged with an unseen energy, the metallic tang intensifying, a taste of something ancient and wrong. And then, the GPS glitched. The map on the screen twisted and distorted, the familiar grid of streets dissolving into a chaotic maze of lines and symbols that pulsed and shifted, a digital echo of the unseen realms that Silas had spoken of. The voice guidance, usually a calm, reassuring female voice, was replaced by a series of static-laced whispers, their voices a dissonant chorus that seemed to emanate from the very heart of the device, their words a chilling murmur against the backdrop of the rain's insistent drumming. Turn. Left. He awaits. The path. The hidden path. Leads to. Him. I glanced at Silas in the rearview mirror, his gaze fixed on the malfunctioning GPS, his blue eyes gleaming with an unsettling intensity, a hint of triumph in their depths, as if he had been expecting this, as if he had orchestrated it. Fear, a cold fist, tightened around my heart. The whispers, the GPS's erratic behavior, the unsettling presence of the man in my back seat. It was all connected, all part of a pattern, a narrative that was unfolding around me, a story that was both terrifying and impossible to ignore. I had stumbled into a darkness I couldn't comprehend, a world where the lines between reality and nightmare blurred, a realm where the whispers in the machine were no longer just static and interference, but a chorus of voices beckoning me towards the abyss. The GPS, its screen a swirling vortex of distorted lines and pulsing symbols, directed me deeper and deeper into the city's labyrinthine heart. The rain-slicked streets, reflecting the neon glow of streetlights and storefronts, seemed to twist and turn leading me further and further away from the familiar, well-lit avenues towards a darkness that felt both ancient and unsettling. The whispers, amplified by the GPS's malfunctioning speakers, filled the car, their voices a chilling counterpoint to the rhythmic click of the turn signal and the steady thrum of the engine. He's near. He awaits. The path leads to him. My hands gripped the steering wheel, my knuckles white, my gaze darting between the road ahead and the distorted map on the GPS screen. The buildings lining the streets grew older, more dilapidated, their windows dark, their doorways shadowed, as if the city itself was succumbing to the darkness that Silas had spoken of, a darkness that seemed to emanate from the man sitting calmly in my back seat. I glanced at him in the rearview mirror, his gaze still fixed on the GPS his blue eyes glowing with an eerie intensity in the dim light, a faint smile playing on his lips, a smile that made me shiver, a smile that suggested he knew something I didn't, that he was in control, that he was leading me somewhere. Fear, a cold sweat slicking my palms, battled against the stubborn streak of defiance that had always defined me, the need to assert my control, to break free from the unsettling influence that seemed to be closing in, suffocating me. Where are we going, Silas? I asked, my voice a gruff rumble, forcing the words past the knot of dread that tightened in my throat. He turned his gaze towards me, his eyes meeting mine in the mirror, their intensity making me look away, a wave of dizziness washing over me, the metallic tang in the air so strong it felt like a physical presence, a taste of blood and something else something ancient and alien that lingered on my tongue. The path, it chooses you, Joran, he said, his voice a soft melodic murmur that seemed to soothe the whispers, to bring them into a chilling harmony. It leads you, 
where you need to go. His words, cryptic and unsettling, offered no reassurance, only a deeper sense of foreboding. The buildings outside the car's windows grew darker, more dilapidated, their shadows stretching across the narrow street, the alleyways between them gaping maw of darkness that seemed to beckon to whisper secrets. The GPS, its voice guidance now a distorted mumble, directed me down a narrow alleyway, its pavement cracked and broken, its air thick with the stench of garbage and a metallic tang that now tasted like blood. Dead end, I muttered, my gaze fixed on the brick wall that loomed at the end of the alley, the shadows deepening around us, the whispers intensifying, their voices a chorus of urgency and dread. He's here. He awaits. The gateway is near. I glanced at Silas in the rearview mirror, his gaze fixed on the alley's shadowy depths, his blue eyes glowing with an eerie light, his smile a chilling secret. We're here, Joran, he said, his voice a soft whisper that seemed to echo the whispers in the air, a confirmation of the nightmare unfolding around me. This is where the path ends. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a $20 bill, its crispness a stark contrast to the surrounding decay, its green ink a splash of color in the monochrome world that had closed in around us. Thank you for the ride, Joran, he said, placing the bill on the dashboard, its touch a whisper of coldness against my skin. And beware the whispers. They have a way of leading you astray. He opened the car door, the metallic clang a jarring intrusion into the alley's unsettling silence, and stepped out into the shadows. I watched him go, his tall, slender form disappearing into the darkness, the scent of lavender lingering in the air, a ghostly reminder of the impossible, the supernatural, the truth that I, Jory, the jaded rideshare driver, could no longer deny. And then, he was gone, vanished. I stared at the empty back seat, the $20 bill a chilling reminder of his presence, the whispers swirling around me, their voices a mix of mockery and a strange, mournful sorrow. He's gone. He's crossed over. He's found what he was looking for. I reached for the $20 bill, its surface cold and smooth beneath my fingertips. And there, in the corner, barely visible, was the spiral symbol, its lines swirling, its energy a palpable presence that sent a shiver down my spine. The whispers intensified, their voices a chilling chorus, their words a warning that echoed in the silence of the deserted alleyway. He's not alone. He'll be back. And he'll bring... others. I sat in the car, the engine idling, the silence of the deserted alley a heavy weight that pressed down on me amplifying the whispers that now seemed to emanate from the very fabric of the car itself, their voices a mix of mockery and a chilling premonition. He's gone, but he'll be back, and he'll bring others. I stared at the $20 bill on the dashboard, its crispness a jarring contrast to the grime and decay that surrounded us, the spiral symbol in its corner a dark stain against the familiar green ink. I had to get out of this alley, away from this place where reality had twisted, where the impossible had become real. But as I put the car in gear, the engine sputtered, coughed, and died, plunging the alley into a darkness that felt deeper, more absolute than the absence of light. Panic, a cold fist, tightened around my heart. I tried the ignition again, the engine cranking but refusing to catch its silence a mockery of my own desperate attempts to regain control. The whispers intensified, their voices a swirling vortex that pressed against my mind, their words a chilling echo of Silas's warning. Beware the whispers. They have a way of leading you astray. I grabbed my phone, its screen a beacon of hope in the darkness, its battery icon flashing a warning red. No signal. Of course not. Not here. Not in this place where technology seemed to unravel, where the digital world I had come to rely on was as fragile as a spider's web. I slammed my fist against the steering wheel, the sound a hollow thud that echoed in the silence, 
my frustration a feeble defiance against the growing sense of dread. I had to get out of here. I grabbed my flashlight, its beam a meager weapon against the encroaching shadows, and stepped out of the car, the metallic tang thick in the air, a taste of blood and decay that made my stomach churn. The alley was a narrow canyon of brick and shadow, the buildings on either side looming, their windows dark, their doorways gaping maw of blackness that seemed to watch me, to judge my every move. I retraced my steps, the whispers following me, their voices a chilling counterpoint to the rhythmic click of my heels against the cracked pavement. I emerged from the alley onto a street that felt both familiar and unsettlingly strange. The buildings, once solid and reassuring, now seemed to lean towards me, their shadows stretching across the rain-slicked pavement, their windows reflecting the streetlight's distorted glow. The city, once a haven of anonymity, a place where I could disappear into the crowd, now felt like a hunting ground, a labyrinth of shadows and whispers, a place where the impossible had become real, where I, Joran, the jaded rideshare driver, was no longer a mere observer, but a participant in a nightmare that was unfolding around me. I had to make sense of this. I had to understand. I needed answers. Back in my apartment, the silence felt oppressive, a heavy weight that contrasted with the city's usual nocturnal hum, a silence broken only by the ticking of the clock on the wall and the whispers that now seemed to emanate from the very walls, the furniture, the shadows themselves. I pulled out Silas's $20 bill, its crispness a jarring anomaly in my cluttered, messy world. I held it up to the lamplight, its green ink shimmering, the spiral symbol in its corner a dark stain that seemed to pulse with an unseen energy. I had to find out what it meant. I spent the next few days researching. My apartment transformed into a war room, its walls covered in maps, notes, and sketches, the air thick with the scent of coffee and a growing sense of desperation. I tracked Silas's ride through the city, using the rideshare app's data logs, piecing together his route, his destination, the point where he had vanished. The address he had given me, a nondescript office building in the heart of the financial district, was a dead end. The building had been abandoned for years, its windows boarded up, its entrance sealed with a heavy metal grate. I searched online scouring news archives, historical records, and urban legend forums, hoping to find some clue, some connection, to Silas's disappearance, to the spiral symbol, to the whispers that haunted my mind. And then, I found it. A blog post buried deep within a forum dedicated to the paranormal. A post written by a man named Kellen, a former security guard at the abandoned office building. He described strange occurrences, unexplained phenomena, and a chilling encounter with a shadowy figure that matched Silas's description. He was tall and pale, his eyes like chips of ice, Kellen wrote, his words a chilling echo of my own experience. He spoke of things I couldn't comprehend, of ancient powers, of gateways to other realms. He said he was searching for something, something he called the Bloodstone. The bloodstone. The name sent a shiver down my spine, a cold dread settling in my gut. I remembered Larkin's postcard, his cryptic message from the Andes. The gateway is near. It calls to me. I can feel its power, its hunger. The whispers intensified, their voices swirling around me, their words a chilling confirmation of the connection between Silas, Larkin, the spiral symbol, the abandoned building, the bloodstone, and the whispers that now seem to be everywhere, in the wind, in the shadows, in the very air I breathed. I had stumbled upon a mystery that was far deeper, far more sinister, than anything I had ever imagined. And I, Jory, the jaded rideshare driver, the man who had always scoffed at the supernatural, now found myself drawn into a world where the lines between reality and nightmare blurred, a world where the whispers in the machine were no longer just static and interference, but a chorus of voices beckoning me towards a darkness I couldn't comprehend. The rain had stopped, but the city felt damp, cold, the air thick with a mist that clung to the streets, seeped into my bones. 
The whispers, a constant hum against my sanity, urged me onward, their voices a mixture of fear and a strange, compelling excitement. He seeks the bloodstone, the gateway, the whisperwood. He calls to you. Larkin's postcard, with its cryptic message and the swirling spiral symbol, lay on my kitchen table, beside the $20 bill Silas had given me, its own spiral a dark stain that seemed to mock my attempts at rational thought. The connection was undeniable. Silas, Larkin, the whispers, the symbol. They were all threads in a tapestry of darkness that was slowly unraveling, revealing a world I had never imagined, a reality where the lines between the mundane and the supernatural blurred. I had to find Larkin. I had to understand. The Whisperwood. The name echoed in my mind, a place where secrets lingered, where shadows whispered, where the veil between our world and the realm beyond was thin, fragile. I packed a bag, tossing in essentials, clothes, food, a flashlight, and my camera, its lens a shield against the unknown, a tool to capture the truth, no matter how terrifying. And I tucked Silas's $20 bill into my pocket, its presence a talisman, a guide, a reminder of the path I had to follow. The drive to the Whisperwood was a blur, the city lights fading behind me, the highway stretching onward, a ribbon of asphalt that led me deeper and deeper into a world where the familiar rules of logic and reason no longer applied. As I entered the forest, the air grew colder, the scent of pine needles and damp earth mingling with the metallic tang, a cloying sweetness that now seemed to permeate the very air I breathed. The whispers intensified, swirling around me, their voices a chorus of warning and a strange, mournful anticipation. He's here. He's waiting. He's hungry. The trees, their branches gnarled and twisted, their silhouettes dark and menacing against the twilight sky, seemed to close in on me, their leaves rustling like whispers, their shadows stretching across the forest floor, a labyrinth of darkness that swallowed the path ahead. I found the twisted oak, its branches resembling grasping claws, its presence a beacon of dread, its roots marking the entrance to the cave, the gateway that Larkin had sought, the threshold he had crossed. The air crackled with an unseen energy, the whispers a deafening roar, their voices urging me onward, deeper into the heart of the Whisperwood, closer to the darkness that awaited. He's calling. He's chosen you. He will show you. The way. I hesitated, fear a cold fist tightening around my heart. But the thought of Larkin, lost in the labyrinth of his own obsession, his sanity unraveling, his fate unknown, spurred me forward. I had to find him, even if it meant confronting the darkness, the whispers, the entity that guarded the gateway, the otherworldly horrors that awaited me in the depths of the Whisperwood. I stepped onto the path, its surface covered in moss and decaying leaves, their softness muffling my footsteps, as if the forest itself was conspiring to silence my approach. The whispers intensified, their voices a chilling harmony that echoed through the trees, a guide and a torment, a promise and a threat. And as I ventured deeper into the whisperwood I knew, with a certainty that transcended logic and reason, that I had crossed a threshold, a point of no return, a journey into a darkness that would change me forever. The path led me deeper into the Whisperwood's embrace, the air growing heavy with the scent of decay, the whispers a cacophony of voices that echoed through the trees, a symphony of madness and despair. The forest floor, a treacherous carpet of moss and roots, seemed to writhe and shift beneath my feet, the shadows lengthening, their forms twisting and contorting as if alive. Fear, a cold hand, gripped my heart, but I pressed onward, driven by the desperate hope of finding Larkin, of rescuing him from the darkness that had consumed him, of unraveling the mystery that had drawn me into this nightmare. The cave entrance, a jagged maw of shadow and stone, loomed before me, the spiral symbol carved into its lintel pulsing with a faint blue light, a beacon of otherworldly power, a warning of the horrors that lay within. I stepped inside, the air thick with the stench of sulfur and decay, 
the metallic tang so strong it tasted like blood on my tongue. The whispers intensified, their voices a swirling vortex of madness and despair, their words a chilling echo of Larkin's descent into the abyss. He is here. He awaits. He will consume. The cave's tunnels were a labyrinth, their paths twisting and turning, their dimensions shifting, the air thick with a palpable sense of dread. The bioluminescent fungi that clung to the walls pulsed with an eerie green light, their glow casting grotesque shadows that danced and writhed, revealing glimpses of monstrous forms lurking at the edges of my vision. I stumbled over Larkin's discarded belongings, his backpack torn open, its contents scattered. A compass with a shattered glass, a sketchbook filled with disturbing drawings, a crumpled photograph of him, his eyes wide with a terrifying mix of fear and exhilaration. The whispers, their voices a chorus of torment, echoed through the tunnels, their words a chilling reminder of the darkness that consumed those who ventured too far, who sought to unlock the secrets of the unseen world. He's watching. He's testing. He's hungry. And then, I saw it. A swirling vortex of energy, a kaleidoscope of colors that shifted and pulsed, its light a terrifying blend of beauty and dread, its whispers a symphony of madness and despair. It was the gateway, the threshold, the portal to the other realm, a rift in the fabric of reality, a wound in the world itself. The air crackled with energy, the metallic tang now a suffocating presence, the whispers a deafening roar that threatened to shatter my sanity. I peered into the vortex, my mind reeling, my senses overwhelmed. I saw glimpses of a landscape that defied logic and reason, a world of twisted beauty and unimaginable horror, a realm where shadows danced with a life of their own, where the laws of nature were broken, where the very fabric of reality was fluid, shifting, a canvas painted by nightmares. And there, at the heart of the vortex, stood Larkin, but it wasn't the Larkin I knew, the friend, the artist, the adventurer. His form was distorted, grotesque, his body a canvas of pulsating flesh and bone, his eyes burning with a cold blue light, his voice a rasping whisper that echoed through the vortex, a chilling parody of the man he had once been. He was a conduit, a vessel, his humanity consumed by the darkness he had sought to control, his soul a prisoner of the other realm. Reese, he whispered, his voice a twisted echo of the friend I had known, a mournful cry from the depths of the abyss. You, you came, but it's too late. The gateway, it's open. He's free. The whispers intensified, their voices merging into a single deafening roar that shook the very foundations of the cave. The air crackled with energy. The metallic tang, now a taste of blood on my tongue, the vortex pulsing, expanding, its light a blinding white that threatened to consume me. And then, I saw him, the ethyl fire. It emerged from the vortex, a being of pure energy, its form shifting and coalescing, a kaleidoscope of colors and shadows, its presence a suffocating weight that pressed down on me, its voice a symphony of whispers that echoed through my mind a chilling chorus of madness and despair. He is free. He is hungry. He will consume. The cave trembled, the walls groaning, the bioluminescent fungi dimming, their light extinguished by the ethyl fire's overwhelming power. I stumbled back, my sanity unraveling, the whispers clawing at my mind, their voices a seductive siren song that urged me to surrender, to embrace the darkness to become one with the entity that now ruled this realm. But even as the darkness threatened to consume me, a flicker of defiance, a spark of the pragmatism that had always defined me, refused to be extinguished. I remembered the Talaquil cipher, the ancient device hidden in my pocket, its bronze surface cold against my skin, its hum a faint vibration that pulsed with the ethyl fire's energy. Larkin's journal, its pages filled with cryptic symbols, offered a solution, a desperate gamble, a chance to contain the darkness, to protect our world from the entity's insatiable hunger. The cipher, a key to the language of the other realm, a conduit for its power, could also be used to bind, to control, 
to imprison. It was a choice, a sacrifice, a burden I had never sought, a destiny I never imagined. But in that moment, facing the ethel fire's overwhelming power, the whispers, seductive whispers, the crumbling ruins of my friend's sanity, I knew what I had to do. I raised the cipher wheel, its bronze surface gleaming in the ethel fire's light, its symbols pulsing, and chanted the words of binding, their syllables ancient, their power both terrifying and exhilarating. The air crackled, the cave shook, the vortex pulsed, as the ethel fire, its form writhing, its energy recoiling, roared its defiance. You, you dare defy me, you, a mere mortal? I am more than that now, ethel fire, I said, my voice firm, my resolve a shield against the whisper's seductive allure. I am the guardian, I am the jailer, and I will not let you escape. The whispers, their voices, a chorus of rage and despair, screamed their defiance, but the binding held. The cipher's power, a conduit that channeled the ethel fire's energy back into the vortex, sealing the gateway, trapping the entity within its otherworldly prison. The cave fell silent, the air clearing, the metallic tang fading, the whispers receding into a distant hum, a mournful echo of the darkness that remained a constant reminder of the eternal vigilance required to keep the balance, to protect our world from the forces that lurked just beyond the veil. Larkin, his form shimmering, his eyes flickering with a glimmer of recognition, a flicker of gratitude, reached out a hand, his touch a whisper of coldness against my skin. Thank you, Reese, he whispered, his voice a faint echo, his words a bittersweet farewell. You... You saved us, but the price, it's high. And then with a sigh, a whisper of wind that dissipated into the silence. He was gone, his spectral form dissolving into the darkness, his soul a prisoner of the other realm, a sacrifice made to protect the world from the ethel fire's wrath. I stood alone in the silence of the cave, the Talaquil cipher a cold weight in my hand, its hum a constant reminder of the burden I now carried, the darkness I had bound myself to, the eternal vigilance that awaited me. I had come to the Whisperwood seeking answers, seeking my friend. But the journey had transformed me, shattered my skepticism, revealed a world I had never imagined, a darkness that I would forever be bound to guard against. I had become the guardian of the threshold, a prisoner of my own making, a silent sentinel against the forces that whispered from the realms beyond, my life a chilling testament to the consequences of seeking the unknown. 